Okay, so first of all, greetings to everyone. And a couple of points before we begin. One is, can I have a wave, please? Just so I know that I'm being heard, not speaking to myself. Okay, thank you very much. Secondly, um, it's much easier to speak to faces than black boxes. So if you care to show me your face, that makes it easier. Of course, I fully understand if you haven't uh, curled your eyelashes or whatever else is, uh, you know, absolutely necessary to be seen. But um, I fully understand. I always curl my eyelashes. So um, anyway, that will make it easier. Uh, second point, I'd like to greet many old friends. I'm not going to mention any names because then I'll definitely leave somebody, <coughs> somebody out. But I see old friends from Australia, Toronto, uh, Cape Town, SR. Nice to see you. Um, and uh, many others. So Switzerland, who do I see? I see Switzerland, I see um, South Africa, Israel, um, and many others. Secondly, thank you very much to Ariel in Cape Town, who's doing the admin. So making sure that we are functioning online. appreciate that. <coughs> thank you to my daughter, Nahama, who sort of set up this whole, <coughs> this whole system in the first place. <coughs> and my son, Betty. <clears throat> who are behind the website and uh, getting all this done. So great appreciation to them. I also want to make a special thank you to people who've contributed financially. On my website, there's a place to contribute. And I'd like to make it absolutely clear that there's no need to contribute. It's completely free what we do. And um, certainly people are welcome to listen to everything that I, uh, <clears throat> that I make available. But of course, it helps us to <clears throat> do this work and support everything that I'm doing. So very much appreciated, especially moved by the fact that people have contributed <clears throat> over the last uh, few months and no one's been approached. It's all been completely spontaneous. <clears throat> so that's very much appreciated. Let me share with you an idea. I also appreciate people who've joined the newsletter so that we stay in touch. And that is something that I appreciate. Let me, um, and by the way, that's why we do these uh, pre-festival shirim just my way of staying in contact with people who want to be personally in touch and uh, express my appreciation. Let me share with you an insight into Purim that I hope you'll find useful. Something very challenging, a question that many people ask, young people ask this question. And I once heard this question put to Rav Moshe Shapiro, my great teacher. As always, I have a picture of him handy for those who, who don't know who he was, one of the great thinkers and minds of the last generation to whom I owe most of my Torah understanding. And I once heard this question put to him, and I'd like to share with you his very interesting and original and creative answer, and I hope it will give you an insight into many things besides Purim. And the question is, the question is the question of beauty, and I'm talking particularly <coughs> about womanly beauty, and I'm talking particularly about the beauty of the body. To put it, to put it one way, the body is beautiful. On the other hand, it is also a cause of shame. We wear clothing, we cover the body. But on the other hand, Adam and Eve, Adam and Chava were created naked. They were not ashamed. On the one hand, we uh, praise the beauty of the body. <clears throat> it is the subject, probably the most common <clears throat> single subject in art, <clears throat> painting, sculpture, since Greek times. And yet, on the other hand, we don't walk around naked. So, so, so there's a beauty, and yet there's, there's a sense of shame as well involved in the body. And I'd like to show you that this dichotomy or this tension runs through Torah. <clears throat> Try to explain as carefully as I can <coughs> the tension between these two positions. <coughs> and suggest to you, <coughs> I think, a fundamental and very original way of seeing this from a Torah perspective. Let's, uh, let's put it like this. On the one hand... <coughs> The Torah praises womanly beauty <clears throat> in tremendous, tremendously clear terms. For example, <clears throat> we have description in the Torah itself of the great mothers of the Jewish people <coughs> being exquisitely beautiful. How many examples? The Torah says that Sarah, Sarah Imani was, was extremely beautiful. The Gemara says her beauty was an echo of Eve's cosmic beauty. Um, it was an echo. On the one hand, she was incredibly beautiful. On the other hand, her beauty compared to Eve's was like a monkey compared to a human. But that's in relative terms. But there's no question she was exquisitely beautiful. Our sources make it clear that Rivka and Rachel were extremely beautiful. Leah had something with her eyes, so her beauty's not brought out in that way. But the great mothers of the Jewish people were un unbelievably beautiful. Uh, Dina was exquisitely beautiful, the Ramban says. 
The only reason the Torah doesn't mention it explicitly is because she was molested because of her beauty and because of that painful incident. The Torah doesn't speak about it, <clears throat> but she was definitely beautiful. And you have the great women of Jewish history praised in the Torah itself for their beauty. <clears throat> one thinks of Rachav, a woman so beautiful. I mean, on the one hand, <clears throat> she started life in a very immoral situation. On the other, <clears throat> she converted to Judaism and ended up marrying Joshua, right? You're sure. Not a bad, not a bad outcome, one of the greatest personalities of all of Jewish history. But the Gemara says her beauty was so extreme that men thinking about her lost all control. Just thinking about her, you could lose all sense, all semblance of control. I mean, an extreme expression of physical beauty. Uh, Avigail, tremendous beauty. The Gemara says that, that when King David once saw her skirt lift, her skirt lifted and some of her leg was exposed and King David traveled miles by the light of the beauty of her leg. You're talking about extreme expressions of female beauty. And that raises many, many questions. The first question that raises is, why is that important? Why does the Torah make a great fuss about womanly beauty? The Torah is a spiritual document, a document of spiritual teaching, of how to be in the world, how to be spiritual in the world. Why is it important that the women were physically beautiful? <clears throat> You know, when I give this talk <clears throat> sometimes to young ladies, let's say in the Beis Yaakov movement, <clears throat> they always look at me with great sympathy and they say, Rabbi, you don't understand. The Torah is not talking about physical beauty. It's talking about spiritual beauty. That's what the young ladies say to me. That is definitely wrong. That is totally wrong. And the reason we know it's wrong is because the Egyptians were ready to kill for Sarah. The Egyptians were not into spiritual beauty. They were not looking for a new Rebetzin, I can assure you. The Egyptians were the most depraved people imaginable. And they were ready to kill a man to take his wife. There's no question <clears throat> that we're talking about sensual beauty. Not only that, Rachav's beauty was so great, the Gemara goes into graphic sensual terms about the effect that she had on men. <clears throat> we're not talking about spiritual beauty. We're talking about lustful, <coughs> at least potentially. <clears throat> You'll have to forgive me. I've, 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 had a, I've had a serious cold since uh, walking in the cold <clears throat> in Prague a few days ago. <coughs> but... We'll do our best. <clears throat> so the Torah is talking about sensual earthly beauty, the kind that brings out lecherous and materialistic and, and, and potentially depraved responses. And the first question to ask is, why on earth is the Torah, which is a, 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 a mode of spiritual being, bothering at all to mention women's beauty? <clears throat> and why is it giving it such prominence? The second question is even more difficult, and that is that at least one man in Torah is described as having beauty, and it's the sort of beauty that's usually reserved, the terms of that beauty are really usually reserved for women. <clears throat> that is Joseph. <clears throat> Yosef, the Torah talks about Yosef as having a, 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 a tremendous beauty of form and appearance, exactly the same words that it uses for women. And again, it goes into extreme terms. Yosef was so beautiful that when he used to travel in Egypt, the women would if the women were peeling vegetables, the Medrash says they would peel their hands. <clears throat> they clamored over each other. You know, a, a modern ce celebrity culture is nothing compared to, compared to the attractiveness of Yosef. And one, again, must ask the question, if beauty is relevant to women, perhaps one could begin to understand. But why is beauty relevant to a man that has a female type of a beauty? <clears throat> what on earth does that mean? <clears throat> so the first question to ask is, why is the Torah emphasizing feminine beauty? particularly the beauty that is bodily, potentially sensual type of a beauty that seems extremely perplexing. So far, so good. Are we together? Okay. Second question to ask is, the very same Torah that talks about feminine beauty makes it absolutely clear that feminine beauty or this type of beauty that we're talking about is to be denigrated and, and distanced and regarded in extremely negative fashion. The very same Torah. Now, one can think of so many statements that make this clear. One is the statement of the sages, Altistakel Bakankan Elamar Do not look at the vessel, look at the contents. When you have a barrel of wine, don't look at the barrel, <clears throat> look at the contents. The modern English idiom is do not judge a book by its cover. That's the modern, I hate to tell you this, my friends, but the cover is very important. If you write books, you'll know <clears throat> the cover is very important. They spend more money on the beauty of the cover than the than the printed. Uh, quality of the pages of the book uh, what can i say but it's not good it's not good and our sages warn us against that do not look at the vessel but look at the content so you see our sages who are the proponents of a torah exponents of a torah 
that praises external female beauty <clears throat> are warning you that it's a, it's a trap and something to be, to be discouraged and not looked at. One thinks of many other statements. For example, the Pasuk, I'm sure it's all going through, you, through all, of, all of your minds. The verse is, Sheker achen, yofi. Right? Sheker achen, that means that charm is a lie. And beauty is hevel. Hevel means if ephemeral, <coughs> vacuous, total emptiness. That's what our Torah says about beauty. You know, we choose to sing that to our wives on Friday night. I've always thought that's a bit strange. You know, Shabbos, you're standing there, you know, about to make kiddush. Your wife, no doubt, looks absolutely stunning. She may look a little tired by that stage of the week, you understand. But no doubt, she's looking stunning. And we start singing this song to our wives about Shekhar and We say, darling, you look amazing, but, you know, charm is a lie and beauty is all vanity. I mean, that's a little strange, I think. But be that as it may, we are talking here about physical beauty and we are running it down. <clears throat> and King Solomon, the wisest of all people, <clears throat> is telling us, that charm is all a lie and physical beauty is a empty vanity. <coughs> <coughs> Here you have the wisest of all people, one of the greatest exponents of Torah ever, telling you that physical beauty is extremely problematic. I think we have a serious, a serious uh, contradiction. I think we have a very serious contradiction. We have a Torah emphasizing feminine beauty. And the very same Torah is making it clear that, that, that feminine external beauty is extremely problematic and, and, and a lie and, uh, and a, uh, something to be denigrated. If there ever was a, a contradiction in a set of sources, I think this has to be the source. Would you agree? You agree we have a contradiction? You know, in the religious world, <clears throat> when you think about that verse, <clears throat> we say, Shekhar Achein Hevel Ayofi, that, that um, vanity and emptiness is beauty. In the religious world, when a young man is introduced to a young lady and they talk about the shidduch, you know, you want to tell the young man about the young lady. You tell her, you know, she's spiritual and all her qualities. But of course, every young man wants to know if she's good looking as well. Well, you can't talk about if she's good looking or not. That's, uh, that's a bit vulgar. So you tell him she's got lots of shaker and hevel. You know, that's how you do it. <laughs> she's got lots of, uh, you know, lies and lies and vanity. That's a coded way of saying she's good looking as well. Okay, you know. That's how we do it. But the point is, it's called Sheker and it's called Hevel. Furthermore, when the Talmud analyzes this question, <clears throat> when the Talmud analyzes the question of physical beauty, <clears throat> it teaches absolutely unequivocally that physical beauty is extremely problematic. Let me share with you the insight in the Talmud <clears throat> that deals with this. If you'd like to see the original sources, <clears throat> I included this in a book that I wrote, which is called... Um, as dawn ends the night. And in that book, you'll find the original sources and the Gemara quoted. And if you'd like to research it further, take a look at that book. But let me tell you what the Talmud says. The Gemara says that there was a woman, a Roman woman. She was the daughter of the Caesar, or I guess the emperor of the Middle East at the time, <clears throat> cause of the Caesar's daughter. <clears throat> she met one of the great sages, Rabbi Shur ben Hanania. <clears throat> Mishur ben Hananiah was the great sage of his day. We're going back to the Mishnaic period 2,000 years ago. Mishur ben Hananiah was the wisest of the Jews. One of his names in the Talmud is Hakim the Yudoi, one of the great or the greatest sage of the Jewish people. And despite his incredible wisdom, he was very, very ugly, possibly even in some way misshapen. In fact, he was so ugly that when this Roman woman met him, she wasn't even ashamed to ask him about his ugliness. Obviously, it was so explicit and so, ex so expressed that it, you know, it wasn't even an issue to address openly. And she said to him, as soon as she met him, she knew of his fame as a great sage. And when she met him, she, she exclaimed the following exclamation. She said, how could such beautiful wisdom be contained in such an ugly vessel? That was her, that was her reaction. She saw the sage of indescribable wisdom in a body which is broken and, 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 and disproportionate and, and, and ugly. And she was struck by the tension or the dichotomy between these two. She said, how could such beautiful wisdom be contained in such an ugly vessel? Before I tell you what the rabbi replied, let's spend a moment trying to understand that question. This is a Roman woman. There are no accidents in the Talmud. Every detail is relevant. She's Roman and a woman. First of all, as a woman, She's bothered by this question. Woman is the locus of beauty. Women have a sense of beauty, a sense of the aesthetic. Men have it too sometimes, but it's a feminine quality. And therefore, she as a woman is concerned about beauty. 
and she sees the discrepancy, the dichotomy, the tension between inner beauty, which she fully appreciates, and <clears throat> external ugliness, and she's struck by the, by, the, by the tension between the two. Furthermore, she's a Roman woman. Rome was the legacy of Greece. You know that Rome was not a culture of its own. Rome was the mighty empire that spread Greek culture around the world, right? Greece was the culture, the absolute pinnacle of philosophy and aesthetics. And in fact, today, all of our culture, which was foisted upon us by the, by the Roman Empire, is all Greek. If you know anything about modern architecture, philosophy, politics, which is a Greek word, <clears throat> drama, poetry, English language, our total structure today is Greek. You cannot move intellectually in the West without basing yourself on Greek foundations. <clears throat> the Greek ideal was <clears throat> a beautiful mind and a beautiful body. That was the Greek ideal. The Romans took that up. The Romans put it into their Latin, mens sana in corpora sana. That was the Latin expression, a healthy mind and a healthy body. But it goes back to the Greeks. Let me ask you something. Why were the Greek games played naked? Why were the Olympic games played naked? Do you think you run faster when you're naked? My friends, it's not true. I can assure you. The reason the Greek games were played naked was because they wanted to show the beauty of the body. Greece raised philosophy to its apex, and they raised the body to its apex. The, 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 the pinnacle of Greek, of Greek ideology was a very potent mind. They developed philosophy to a tremendous degree, to such a degree that a good percentage of the Jewish people were Hellenized, drawn away from Torah by Greek wisdom. Some of the greatest rabbis of the age <clears throat> became Hellenized and were attracted by Greek philosophy. So Greece was the competition for Torah, and to this day it has the upper hand, there's no question about it, to the extent that it swept the West. All Western thought today is based on Greece. Everything, drama is based on, a, on, on Greek comedy and Greek tragedy, the English language, all the philosophy. Again, we are Greeks, my friends, and she as a woman representing the legacy of Greece <clears throat> is tremendously taken by the essential nature of a beautiful mind and a beautiful body, and that's the way it has to be. Incidentally, for those of you who are into art, you'll know there's an old debate in art about whether a beautiful painting needs a beautiful frame or a beautiful painting needs a simple frame, <clears throat> which is the one that brings out the, <clears throat> the beauty of the painting best. <clears throat> but nevertheless, this is the concept. The concept is picture, frame, content, vessel. This is the debate. And as a Greek child, a Roman woman, she asks the question, how can such beautiful wisdom be contained in such an ugly vessel? That's her question. The rabbi answered her as follows. <clears throat> he said, what does your father keep his wine in? She said, wine, my father? He keeps his wine in clay vessels. Glazed earthenware, they were called amphora, the old glazed uh, china vessels, like everyone else. He said to her, but surely for a king, that's not fit. Surely a king's wine should be in gold and silver vessels. She thought, absolutely, that makes total sense. She went back to the palace and she went into her father's wine cellars and she had all the wine put into gold and silver vessels. When you put alcohol into metal, the alcohol reacts with the metal and all the wine was ruined. So when they served the wine at Caesar's table, he said, what's going on? She said, the rabbi told me to do it. So Caesar called in Rabbi Shobel Khan and he said to him, Rabbi, what's going on? The rabbi said, Caesar, I told your daughter, I replied to her exactly what she said to me. She said, how could such beautiful content be contained in such an ugly vessel? And I showed her that when the vessel makes its own impression, when the vessel speaks for itself, when the vessel puts itself forward and makes its own statement, then it finds itself in conflict with the content and it, and it ruins the content. That's the, that's the principle I taught her. You cannot have both. <clears throat> if the vessel is making its own statement, its own, it has its own presence, let's call it ego, its own statement of existence, then it finds itself in contact, in, in conflict with the content. You know, you see this so often. I'll give you a simple example. If you see a little girl who's very pretty, it's a big disadvantage to her. And if she's exquisitely beautiful, she has no chance of making any intellectual headway because people won't take her seriously. Imagine, imagine some incredibly beautiful uh, movie, you know, movie celebrity woman. And someone asks her a question and she says something deeply philosophical. People would laugh. I mean, what are you talking philosophy? That's not what you're here for. A little girl is too good looking is a big disadvantage because she'll always be praised for her looks and her content will never be taken seriously. And that is the way of the world. And therefore, I taught your daughter that she asked me, how can there be such beautiful content in an ugly vessel? I showed her that it's essential. 
When the vessel only contains, it has not ruined the content. But when the vessel wants to make its own statement and forget that it's a vessel and forget that it's here to contain only, then there's a tension between the lights and the vessels or the content and the vessel, and then the one ruins the other. And that's what I taught her. Now, this girl was not a pushover. <clears throat> she did not accept the answer. The Talmud does not talk about idiots. <clears throat> she was a very deep thinking woman. And she said, Rabbi, I don't accept your answer. I've met rabbis who are tremendously wise and very good looking. <laughs> you tell me you need to be ugly to be wise. I know rabbis who are tremendously good looking and very wise as well. Who was she thinking of? Probably Rabbi Shmuel Cohen Godel, the, the Mishnah the, we have, who tells us that he was so good looking, so incredibly beautiful. The Romans skinned his face when they killed him to keep it as a mask of beauty. He was so craved for his beauty. Or maybe later of Yochanan was so good looking that he rolled up. He once went to visit a friend of his who was poverty stricken, lying in a dark house and he was ill. And Rabbi Yochanan rolled up his sleeve and lit the house with the incandescence of his beauty. <clears throat> right? Unbelievable. <clears throat> So these rabbis were tremendously good looking and tremendously wise as well. So she said to him, what you're saying doesn't make sense. You tell me you need to be ugly to be good looking. I know rabbis who are very wise and very good looking. And he said to her, you have a sunny, have a gemiri tve. Had they been ugly, they would have been wise. In other words, those great rabbis managed great wisdom despite the disadvantage of good looks. For me, it was easier. That's the section of Talmud that I, that I would like to quote to you. Now, if you look at this, Talmudic analysis, you see very clearly this piece of Talmud is telling you in absolutely right, absolutely incontrovertible terms that good looks are a problem. Yes, you might achieve wisdom despite them, but they're a disadvantage. This is the definitive statement in our sages telling us that external good looks and external beauty is a very serious spiritual problem. Now we have a tremendous contradiction. We have Torah telling us about the beauty of Eve and Sarah and all our great women, and praising it in, in, in undiluted terms. And we have the same Torah telling us that it's vanity and lies. And the Talmud commenting on the subject tells us that beauty is extremely problematic. How do we handle this contradiction? And one final question, if I may. <clears throat> Purim. Esther, Esther was <clears throat> debatable. The Gemara has a fantastic debate about whether Esther was beautiful or not. A very weird debate. One position in the Gemara is she was one of the four most beautiful women who ever lived. An exquisite and cosmically stunning beauty. The other opinion is that she looked strange. She was not beautiful at all. The language in the Gemara is she had a green face. A green face. In fact, if you look in the Medrash, not only did she have a green face, she was 75 years old. 75 years old. Let's just get that picture clear. <laughs> Here's this Persian king, okay, absolute ruler of the world, <clears throat> you know, Eastern potentate. He's looking for a wife. He sends out agents to 127 different countries <clears throat> to bring in the most eligible and beautiful virgins of the real. <clears throat> Those girls must have been unbelievable. By the way, if you're a feminist, this is enough to drive you up the wall. <clears throat> they selected girls against their will from the whole, from the whole Persian kingdom. And then they pickled them in perfumes and, and oils for six months. I mean, and then the king would choose one of them and spend the night with her. And if he didn't like her, he'd never see her again. And she was not allowed to marry anyone else, of course, because in, the, in, that, in that system of royalty, when something's been used by the king, it's invalid for anyone else. I mean, if you're a feminist, this is enough to drive you totally out of your kalim. I mean, you know. But anyway, be that as it may, this Persian king is collecting the most beautiful versions from the whole realm. And his agents go out and they bring in these girls. And among them, they choose a 75-year-old married lady with a green face. What were they thinking? What? And not only that, she's the one the king chose. Yeah, the Megillah Shej had a chut shel chesed, some sort of an unusual charm that made him choose her. Now, what is the meaning of this debate? You know, we have a principle in Talmudic debate <clears throat> that both sides are true. Both positions are true. In fact, Rav Desla taught us that <clears throat> explicitly when it comes to these deep and philosophical areas, <clears throat> that both sides of all these spiritual debates are true. Which means that on the one hand, on the one hand, um, Esther 
was beautiful. On the other hand, she was a problematic looking lady with a green face. How do you establish that both of those sides are true? I mean, how on earth can you resolve that? And that is a, a capsule, if you like, of the contradiction that I'm proposing to you. Let me suggest to you an answer that I hope you'll find interesting and original. And if you grasp it deeply, is a key to many, many other things in Torah. To see the other aspects of Torah that this answer touches on, please take a look at my book as Dawn Ends the Night, because there I have 20 or 30 areas of Torah that Ramoshi Shapiro taught us that depend on a, on a very solid grasp of the principle that I'd like to share with you now. The answer is along these lines. <clears throat> the, the relationship between the body and the soul, the inner content, <clears throat> the wisdom, the soul, <clears throat> the beautiful inner content <clears throat> and the external vessel that we call the body, that is the story of human history. The relationship between these two, what the Kabbalists call the lights and the vessels, <coughs> Oyrois and Kalim, lights inside and the vessels which contain them. This is the story of the human condition. In order to understand it thoroughly, let's go back to the beginning of time and let's think it through together. Please stay with me carefully. This is very, very important material and you won't find it written in many sources. You'll have to look long and hard to find these principles expressed. When Adam and Eve were created, they were naked. <clears throat> they were naked. The Torah makes a very explicit point of telling you they were naked and not ashamed. The Rambam explains, not only were they not ashamed, they were incapable of shame. He says something like this. If you went up to Adam or Eve and looked at their naked bodies and said, aren't you ashamed you're naked? He said they would have responded in the same way as someone now if you walk up to them and say, I can see your hand, aren't you ashamed? In other words, they had no capacity for, shooting, for feeling shame at their body. There was just no way to feel shame. The naked body was not a shameful thing to the extent that if you, if you tried, you couldn't feel shame. Why? Listen carefully, please. The naked body when Adam and Eve were created was a demonstration of the soul. The body was transparent. Some Midrashim put it in simplistic terms like this. They say that the body of Adam was like your nails. Nails are transparent. In fact, many doctors, the first thing they examine when they examine a patient, they look at the nail bed because there you can see the color of the blood you can see if a person's anemic, and some circumstances you can even see the heartbeat. The point is that the, the skin, in simplistic terms, was transparent. But in spiritual terms, it means that the material was giving you a vision of the spiritual. When you looked at the material, you saw the spiritual. In, in, in very, very oversimplified terms, Adam and Eve's bodies were transparent. Let me try to explain this as best I can. Here's one version. The Gemara says that when Adam and Chava were, were, were created, they wore kosnos or garments or tunics of light, ala vavresh. What does it mean to be clothed in a garment of light? Light is the, is the medium of, of revelation. If you're clothed in a garment of light, it means that when I look at your garment, I see your content. To be clothed in garments of light means their bodies glowed. If you like a little hint of this in later history, Moshe Rabbeinu Moses reached that level where his face glowed with a spiritual light. The inner wisdom of the soul shone through the face. You know, I'm sure that the word panim in Hebrew, which means a face, is exactly the same word as panim, which means inside. Panim means outside and panim means inside, right? <clears throat> they were one and the same in his case. And that's why you could see <clears throat> the soul shining out through his face. That's because he reached the level of Adam before the sin. But Adam and Eve, Adam and Chava were living at a level where when you looked at their bodies, you saw their neshamas because the bodies were transparent. Just to put this into context, after the sin, when they crashed the body into warring battle, into life and death conflict, mortal, mortal conflict with the soul, <coughs> then the body became opaque <coughs> and could no longer be seen through. There the Gemara says that after the sin, God clothed them in kosmos or he clothed them in garments of ayin vavresh. Now in Hebrew, alav vavresh spells light. Ayin vavresh, which is a very similar sounding word, spells skin. Or in Hebrew means skin. And skin is something you cannot see through. I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but if you have a Hebrew word spelt with an aleph and then you spell it with an ayin, you are actually witnessing a transition from spiritual to physical. Fantastic exercise. Do this yourself. Hebrew is unbe unbelievable. Hebrew is spiritual chemistry. You take the word like ayin. Ayin with the aleph <clears throat> means it cannot be seen. 
Ayin with an ayin means the eye, <clears throat> which does see, brings it into vision, or a wellspring where the hidden water becomes visible, or the pair of afar and afer. <clears throat> Do it for yourself. You'll find it's a fascinating exercise to see how the Aleph, which is a silent letter, which represents oneness, transmutes itself into an ayin. By the way, Aleph is a silent letter. Ayin is a guttural letter. Is already expressed in the material world. At the origin of human beings' creation, they were clothed in garments of light with an aleph. Because of the sin, they became clothed in garments of uh, not or with aleph, but or with an ayin, which means something that obstructs. If you know a little Hebrew, you know that the word or, which spells skin in Hebrew, is exactly the same word in Hebrew as ifer, which means blind. <clears throat> and that, my friends, is the reason why a skin in English is called a hide. It's called a hide. Where did they get that name from? Somebody has a thick hide. The reason is because originally it was a reveal, and now it's a hide. That is what happened. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> when you're clothed in garments of light, you don't need to put clothing on. Why would you put clothes on a garment like that? When you look at the body, you see the soul. The reason you're ashamed when you're naked is because the body does not show the soul. That's why you're ashamed. Why are we ashamed when we're naked? This is not cultural. I assure you, this is much deeper than cultural. I happen to be African. I come from a place where there's no reason to wear clothes at all. It's very hot. But every African tribe covers at least some part of the body. No matter how hot it is, they cover some part of the body. It's not for, for the weather, I can assure you. It's because there's some part of the body that is always a, a source of shame in all cultures. And the reason is because when you know you're an angelic inner being and you look at your body and it looks animal, that's what causes shame. Shame is always caused by incommensurate states. That's always the reason for shame. If you try something and you fail, when you could not succeed, you don't feel ashamed, you just feel like a failure. If you could have succeeded and should have succeeded and you fail, you feel ashamed. When you fall below your own standard, you should have acted in a more moral fashion and you acted in a moral fashion. That's when you feel ashamed. Shame is always caused by incommensurate states. When you know you're a spiritual inner being and you're housed in a body that looks like a gorilla, that's what causes shame. And what's the solution? You cover it. The covering was originally intended to cover the nakedness of the body. <clears throat> That's why Adam and Chava put fig leaves over their bodies. But Hashem said, I will teach you a lesson for all of history. For the rest of history, remember that spiritual solutions must always make the problem the solution. <clears throat> make this problem the solution. Do not wear clothes to hide your nakedness. Wear clothes to reveal your dignity. And he sewed them beautiful and dignified garments. And that's why in Judaism, we are so fussed about clothing. Shabbat clothes and your clothes should always be neat without any stains on them. And by the way, as an aside, that's why our generation has no value for clothing. 50 years ago, people wore decent clothes in the street and they walked out with a hat on. Today, you can go to the opera wearing your pajamas with somebody's beer advertised across the chest. There were times, my friends, when I was a teenager, you were not admitted to a restaurant unless you had a jacket and tie. <clears throat> you could no go decent place without being dressed for the today you can walk in in your smelly sandals with a t-shirt you know and there's no problem at all okay that's a that's a different that's a that's an aside but the point is that clothing are not only clothing serve two functions they hide your nakedness and they reveal your dignity a king's garments hide the king but they reveal his royalty <clears throat> that's the solution the hebrew word for a garment is levush <clears throat> levush spells <clears throat> Lo bosh, not to be ashamed. That's the meaning of the word. There's another word in Hebrew for garment, and that's beged. And beged means treachery. Beged means treachery. Boged is a traitor. Why? Because when you're naked, what you see is what you get. When you put on clothing, there's no telling what's behind. You know, in, in the 18th century English, a traitor was called a turncoat. That's the old English word for a traitor. <clears throat> because it's the, it's the garment that no longer speaks the truth about what's inside the garment. And that's where the trouble begins. <clears throat> For those of you with a little Kabbalistic interest, I'll point out something amazing. In Hebrew, the Aleph is the letter of the soul, as I've been explaining. Look how the alphabet unfolds in Hebrew. Aleph is the soul. The next three letters are Bet, Gimel, Dalet, Beget, which means that the first letter to be created is the letter of the soul. The next three letters are the three letters that form the garment that surround the soul and bring it into the world. Anyway, that's the issue. Let me put this another way. Rav Desler puts it like this. When Adam was created originally, 
his sense of self was all spiritual, was all soul. The body was not connected to his sense of self. The body, the lecherous, the material, the earthy, spoke from a great distance in the form of a second person serpent saying you. Let's get this clear. When Adam conceived of himself, me, I, it was all soul, all neshama. At a distance was a serpent addressing him as you. After the sin, we have crashed the body into dominance. The body is now what we call I. And the soul speaks from a distance. I don't care how religious you are. That's the case. And I'll prove it to you. Let's say you're facing something delicious that you'd like to taste. Something absolutely delicious, particularly when you shouldn't. Which voice speaks? I'd like to taste that. And your conscience tells you, you know, you shouldn't. Very humiliating. Very humiliating. The sense of self, the first person I, is always the sensor. It's always the body. That's me. The conscience, speaking from a great distance. <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> Moshe Shapiro put it like this. He said the, the soul has been hijacked by the body. When you say I, it's the body speaking. It's taken control of the soul. He used to put it like this. He used to say, what's the right way to rob a bank? <clears throat> you walk in with a motorcycle, helmet, and a gun. That's not for a Jewish boy. The right way to rob a bank is you make an appointment with the bank manager. You walk into his office. You lock the door behind you. You put a sock in his mouth and you tie him up. You lock him up in the closet. You sit at his desk. You run the bank. That's the sensible way to rob a bank. That's what's been done to you by your Yetzirah. Your Yetzirah is running the show and he's saying me. But it's not you. It's him. And you know, my friends, the greatest tragedy, anything you say is him. I'll do this, I'll do that, I'll learn, I'll do a mitzvah. It's him speaking. You know where the real you is? Locked up in the closet going, mm, Ne'ila maybe. Right? That's the human condition. We've been taken over. Right? That's the dichotomy. That is the tension. Now, there's much, much more we could say about it, but that is the human problem. So let's get this clear. When human beings were created, the, the world revealed a unity. Lights and vessels were in perfect harmony. Body and soul operated together. Body was there to demonstrate soul. Body was there to carry soul into the world. Body was there. Guf was to manifest the Shama. They were lived in perfect love, perfect male-female duality. One represented the other one perfectly. When you looked at the body, you saw the Neshama. When the Neshama operated, the body obeyed. <clears throat> they were never in conflict. A body like that does not need clothing. But man and woman crashed the soul into subservience. And they elevated the body to dominance. And now the body calls the shots. And the Shama is dragged along, desperately trying to assert its dominance in a world that's very unfriendly to soul. Now, what was the human response to this problem? <clears throat> Listen carefully. The universal human response from the days of the crash of Adam until now has been universally the same response. You want to be spiritual? Beat the body into, into subservience. Allow the soul to float and beat the body into total discipline. Become an ascetic, a celibate. Don't get married. Don't drink wine. Limit yourself. Live a very, very arduously <clears throat> self-denying life because the body is too dangerous. <clears throat> Let me give you a few examples. <clears throat> Take Christianity. Christianity is fraught with guilt about the sensuality of the body. If you're serious about being holy as a Christian, you have to become a monk or a nun. There's no way you can engage the sensual and get married and be holy. If you get married and in, indulge the sensuality of the body, you will become animalistic and there's no hope for you to become a spiritual individual. How can a religion teach that human reproduction, bringing new life into the world, what could be holier than that? How can they teach that a whole aspect of human drive and human desire and human expression should be completely denied? What are they thinking? The answer is because human sensuality is so dangerous that it's not worth the price. Do you realize, my friends, what price they're paying? Do you realize what a Christian is spiritual? Do you realize the price that he's paying? He's paying the price of a loving relationship, of bodily needs, of self-fulfillment, of creating life in the world. They prepare to give all that up. You know why? Because the body will make you animal. That's an unbelievable perspective. Unbelievable perspective. Nothing could be further from Judaism. If you're a Muslim, you may not own alcohol. Never, never mind drink wine. If you're a Muslim, you're not allowed to own alcohol. You drink wine, that'll bring you down to the material and make you animalistic. You dare not do that. There are some sects that are even more extreme. 
The Mormons, for example. I had a Mormon friend when I was a teenager. Never mind wine. They're not allowed to drink coffee. Do you know that? No Coca-Cola, no coffee, and no tea. They've got caffeine in. Who knows what you might do if you drink a cup of coffee? Do you understand how far this goes? In other words, I'm not kidding you. They do not drink coffee. They don't drink tea. They don't drink a Coca-Cola, which has got caffeine in. Why? Because, because, because if you give the body a chance to express itself, it will, it will pervert you. Eastern religions, virtually every Eastern pathway teaches celibacy and transcendence. You cannot engage the body and be holy. The Buddhists, for example, the Buddhist priests and, and, and nuns, they don't. They have, for example, in Hindu religion, they have a thing called the householder's pathway, which allows them to get married. But it's not the highest pathway. The world, from the, listen carefully, from the days of Adam and Eve until today, the solution to the mind-body problem has been to discipline the body. And religion has always been seen as controlling the body and beating into submission so that the soul can fly. <clears throat> My friends, it's not illogical. It's not illogical. The body is very dangerous. One man, one man taught that that's wrong. Abraham. He said, if you accept that position, that Adam and Eve crashed them into, into a warring relationship, and now the only hope is to beat the body into submission to allow the soul to fly, we're accepting a split world. And we are in the world to manifest Hashem's oneness. Hashem alokein Hashem echad. That body and soul have to operate together. And that's the religion that he founded. And today, if you're a Jew, you're obliged to in, in, engage the material. You have to get married. It's a mitzvah. On the contrary, we call it kiddushin. We call it sanctity. We take the most sordid aspect of the human being and we do a circumcision, which we call an act of sanctification. The, the, the world thinks we're being ridiculous. You have to drink wine if you're a Jew because you need to engage the material and elevate it to the spiritual. And that's an important theme in Judaism. But the point I want to make is this. That's a discussion for another time. The human problem was that originally the perfect harmony of oneness was body and soul being together. And such a world, nakedness was the best thing imaginable. Because when you looked at the naked human body, you saw the kind of unbelievable beauty that spoke of a soul. And that was the original beauty. And that was Eve's beauty. And as history progressed, that relationship became worse and worse and worse. By the time you get to Sarah, you're living in a world where Sarah's beauty was an echo of Eve's. <clears throat> Sarah was the kind of woman, <clears throat> the, Torah is, the Torah is telling you, she had the, and the Chazal say this, the Chazal say that Sarah's beauty, the Imamites, Chazal say, the great mothers of the Jewish people were a reflection of Eve's beauty. What was Eve's beauty? A naked body that could show you the soul. Sarah was a woman whose beauty was so exquisite and so refined and so elevated that when you looked at her, you could see a little bit of the original human. If you're an Egyptian, my friends, there's no hope for you. If you're an Egyptian, you can look at any woman and see a horse. No hope for you at all. Okay. Sarah, but Sarah and Rivka, uh, our great Jewish women, Avigail, they had the ability. What I'm trying to say to you is this. A woman can carry herself and present herself in the world with such a dignity that she shows the spiritual. In Judaism, we call that snius. Snius means that you show yourself with such a refinement. It's very hard for, to, to put into words, but women know how to do this. A woman knows that she can take her provocative beauty and, and bring the gaze down, or she can take that very same provocative beauty and present it with a refinement and a dignity that brings the gaze up. You know, my friends, some ladies think that sneers means making yourself look ugly. That's what they think. Sneers means making yourself look like something the cat dragged in, you know, or something that someone forgot to put in the fridge three weeks ago. No, my friends, that's not sneers. That's just ugly. Sneers means that you take your female beauty and dress and, and, and deport yourself in such a way that when a man looks at you, he thinks of the higher world. That's called sneers. It isn't only the length of a skirt and the length of a sleeve, by the way. It's your deportment. It's the way you speak. It's how much perfume you wear. Some ladies walk into a room with so much perfume, half the, half the men fall over anesthetized, you know. I mean, uh, you know, that's not sneers either, you know. Sneers, sneers doesn't mean that you hide yourself and make yourself look ugly. On the contrary. It means you take that same potentially provocative beauty and you project it in the world. And that's real beauty. The same beauty that could be used in an animalistic fashion. And that's being presented with dignity. There's a tremendous spirituality in that. Much more than in a body that could not present itself in that way. And this has been raised to an art. If any women here in our group would like to study that. <clears throat> Vogue magazine a couple of years ago 
my daughter was teaching a certain a certain young woman who went through the conversion process and she happened to work for vogue magazine and vogue did a study on her as a religious jewish woman now vogue magazine i don't have to tell you it's about fashion and style they did the most beautiful piece on her and her personality and her jewish journey and showed the photographs of her right wearing religious clothing and looking unbelievably exquisite very interesting study that brought this whole issue to the fore right in a woman's fashion magazine but anyway be that as it may and as history progressed that became more and more difficult the whole theme of the descent of the decline of the spiritual in the world as history as history progresses it becomes more and more difficult to use the body to show the spiritual when you lived in the original generation of human history eve adam and eve were able to show that no problem and they crashed it by the time of chava by the time of sarah imenu and rifka and rochel the women still knew how to do that but as history progresses it became more and more difficult when prophecy ended and miracles ended when the spiritual revelation in the world became so difficult and so hard to see it became increasingly difficult to use a body to show a soul and the watershed moment was purim and esther lives on the cusp of that problem esther comes into being at a time when the world is about to go dark purim was the time when the spiritual world went dark what is purim purim is a part of the torah yes but does not mention that the god's name unlike the rest of the torah <clears throat> purim describes a miracle yes but it's a hidden miracle <clears throat> the king couldn't sleep and haman arrived nothing revealed purim's not even a hebrew word it means the lack of the draw you don't see the divine hand esther means the hidden one that's exactly the point she's hidden completely from esther on you no longer see the spiritual and therefore until esther there was a way for womanly beauty and sensual beauty to represent the the spiritual after esther becomes impossible to date sneers means you have to be very careful about how you show any of the sensual because today it's virtually guaranteed to be taken in the wrong way and esther lives at the cusp and therefore what happens after esther 150 years later hanukkah that's exactly when the greeks come on the scene and they start teaching the wrong side of the dichotomy that's exactly when greece comes on the scene and they start teaching naked body beautiful mind and a beautiful body grasping exactly the wrong side of that reality that's exactly our battle with them and therefore esther on the one hand esther harks back to that original beauty she was one of the four most beautiful women ever like our great mothers of history the other position is no it's just too late for that esther was on the wrong side of that divide and the only way she could win over this king without prostituting right and 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 betraying that level of spirit was to have a green face and be 75 years old that's the only way it can be done that's the truth in both sides that's the vacillation the oscillation between those two positions that's represented by esther anyway what we've studied today <clears throat> thanks again to ariel <clears throat> to nahama and to benny and to all of you who've contributed and helped me in this project and keeping the website going what we have studied today is the very interesting theme of the tension the contradiction in torah sources <clears throat> about sensual beauty is it something to be praised and highlighted as our torah does or is it something that's called sheker and hevel and um something to be denigrated that the talmud tells you the talmud of course was written in the dark face yoshua ben hanania is ugly and why is because he lives in the phase where it's no longer possible to be good looking and why is he lives deep and dark deep in the dark phase of history he lives hundreds of years after esther by that time by that time a man who would be exquisitely good looking his wisdom could not be taken seriously or to do that he'd have to be much more wise and by the time yoshua ben hanania comes along but how the talmud comments on this the talmud's telling you that there's no way that the that the vessel can be gold and silver and the wine remain pure that is a dead option in the world today and today the only way to assert in a content is to make sure that the vessel is exceedingly pure and exceedingly um excluded from men, from making any of its own statement and my friends you see that in every way the only way to be sincere is to use simple words the only way to get a sincere message across is simple words the more gilded the words are the more the more the more uh, the more artistry in the words the more you should be suspicious of the content and the more the showmanship of the demonstration the more you need to be concerned about the content and the more glib and slick the presentation and the artwork and the cover of the book and the and the round and the round the more you need to be concerned about the inner content to it's a, a very great art to be articulate and to be beautifully presented and still be true to the content and not be lazy 
right, and betray the content itself. And that's the problem of the world we live in today. It takes a tremendous penetration of the external to see the internal, because the default assumption in today's world is that the external is treacherous. That's the message of Purim. And that's why we wear masks on Purim. I'm sure you can see where this goes. I'm sure you can see all of the ramifications of this. We're wearing masks on Purim because that is the only way the world, right? We're teaching you that the world you're looking at is a masked world. Esther is the hidden one. Don't accept the world at face value. Yeah, it's the mask that needs to be peeled off. Assume that you're looking at a mask. And that's everything. Our Torah teaches us time and again, peel away the layers of meaning to get to an inner content. The outside no longer demonstrates the inside. And today you need a Talmudic process, which is a process of delving beneath the surface to penetrate to the inner content. That's the skill that we need today. Thank you very much for being with me. Thank you again for all of your support. Please avail yourself of the email address on the website. You're very welcome to, to email and I'll, I'll try to respond to everybody <coughs> in time if I can. <coughs> I wish you all a wonderful Purim and uh, thanks for being connected. All the best. <coughs>